Hello there, welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, where we cover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War from 1937 to 1945, and all the major events that led up to it. I could not resist the temptation, and thus this is going to be a historic film review of The Last Samurai. Now you might be thinking, oh boy, he's going to just list all the historical inaccuracies. No, I will not be doing that. Honestly, this movie has been reviewed to death by other amazing YouTubers, such as History Buffs, someone who inspired me to join YouTube. I love The Last Samurai film, and I saw it when I was a kid. It's one of those films that made me fall in love with Japanese history, which is ironic if you consider how historically inaccurate it is. Now before we get started, please hit that like and subscribe button as it would mean a lot to this small channel. And really, take a gander at these four previous episodes I made, completely covering the history present in this film. It's almost as if I planned this in advance. Now, I will be breaking down this movie into three parts. Part number one, summarizing the film. Part number two, summarizing the actual history it's based upon. And part number three, explaining why it's a good movie despite its historical inaccuracies. Part one. This is the story of retired American Captain Nathan Algren, aka Tom Cruise a man tormented by guilt. He is regarded as a war hero, but in truth, he is a lost soul, fueled by nightmares of atrocities he took in part against Native American tribes during the American Indian Wars. Alcoholism is his solace, as he walks a path of self-destruction. He is hired by the Meiji government to quell a samurai rebellion led by Lord Katsumoto, aka Ken Watanabe, which is ironically reminiscent of his quelling of Native American tribes. I have been hired to help suppress the rebellion of yet another tribal leader. Apparently, this is the only job for which I am suited. Japan is going through the Meiji Restoration, a rapid modernization of all aspects of its culture. A multitude of reforms are being made, Western technology and advisors are being employed, and there is a true sense of out with the old, in with the new, feeling to this film. Matsue Amura, an industrialist, pro-reformer who seeks to sign treaties with Western nations and modernize while he makes a profit through his ownership of Japanese railroad networks, is manipulating the young Emperor Meiji like a puppet into signing treaties with Western nations and pushing reforms, all at the cost of Japanese traditions and, of course, the samurai. Amura is a man who employs Algren for the task of quelling the anti-reform samurai and pushes Katsumoto away from the emperor, labeling him a rebel. So he is definitely the antagonist. I mean, in every scene, he's smoking a cigarette and twirling his mustache, so yeah. Algren trains a group of what appears to be helpless Japanese youth learning to use muzzle-loading rifles. Now, a few YouTubers made remarks about these firearms being outdated by, you know, the time period of this film, which is true, but the guns in this film were in fact used by the Imperials, just not as much as more modern rifles like the Schneider Einfield rifle. Algren asks the Japanese general about Katsumoto's supply of firearms, who then says, Katsumoto no longer dishonors himself by using firearms, you see. He uses no firearms. You see, and again, this is supposed to be in 1876. This is pretty ridiculous, but okay. Algren is arguing that the Imperial troops are not ready for combat when they are forced to engage in their first battle against the samurai forces of Katsumoto. In the foggy battlefield, Algren's Imperial forces lose all control and begin to fire prematurely. They then begin to flee in terror as the samurai run them down and cut them into pieces. Captain Algren fights defiantly, killing a samurai in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but is eventually captured by Katsumoto. Algren clearly wants to die at this point in the film, clinging to alcohol to drown out his nightmarish past. Yet through his imprisonment with Katsumoto's clan, he begins to wean off the alcohol and opens his eyes to a way of life he has never seen before. This is the true beauty of the film, the small scenes depicting a romanticized lifestyle of an older Edo past. Although by this point in history, almost all the samurai are living as bureaucrats in more urbanized settings and not in tiny remote villages stuck in the 17th century, the film still gives a feeling of what life was once like. Algren gradually becomes in love with their way of life, the meticulous effort these people put into all things that they do to achieve utter perfection and serenity. These scenes are what really captures a sense of traditional Edo Japan uh, about 200 years before the time the film is supposed to be taking place, mind you. Algren is continuously knocked down and beaten when he tries to learn samurai combat and martial arts, but as futile as it seems to be, he never gives up. 
It is during the training montage that Algren understands the method of clearing one's mind of all distractions, to train constantly so that one can perform acts instinctively, achieving perfection. A clear nod to the Karate Kid and Taoism in martial arts. Algren comes to learn that the samurai he killed before he was captured was the husband to his hostess, Taka, the sister of Katsumoto. Taka is obviously resentful of having to take care of her former husband's murderer, yet Algren and Taka grow to have an unspoken affection for another. It is a very implausible romance to say the least, and reminiscent of uh, another famous film. Algren ends up defending Katsumoto from ninja assassins, which is ridiculous. Uh, ninjas, for the most part, don't really exist anymore in the Bakumatsu period, but uh, whatever, it was awesome as hell, to be honest. Algren becomes an established member of the clan, earning their respect. He seeks to help Katsumoto in his cause, to make the Emperor understand that the traditions of I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true and international effort to pressure their people are all being thrown away. Rendeption, not forgetting traditions of the past, and of course, honor, are key themes to this film. Algren's character arc is intertwined with Katsumoto, who carries out a series of conversations with him throughout his stay with the clan. Algren cannot let go of the shame for the actions he has done in a war, and Katsumoto explains to him, We are all dying, but to understand and value all aspects of life, life in every breath, this is the way of the warrior. Algren is beginning to understand why Katsumoto wages a war that is so futile. Both men know the rebels can't win against the Meiji military, and then Katsumoto in one scene states, The perfect blossom is a rare thing. You could spend your life looking for them, and it would not be a wasted life. Katsumoto's rebellion, for all intensive purposes, is futile. Yet all of his samurai commit to this war on the Meiji state. During one scene, Algren tells Katsumoto of the Battle of Thermopylae, where 300 Spartans held off against a Persian force of over a million men. And yeah, those figures, I guess they're a Herodotus fan or something, because yeah. <laughs> Although uh, they ultimately all died at the battle, the Spartans demoralized the Persians and bought enough time for the rest of Greece to consolidate and fight off Persia. It symbolizes how Katsumoto does not necessarily seek to win the battle, but instead to win the ear of the emperor so he will not throw away the traditions of their people. Algren understanding Katsumoto's cause suits up to fight at the last battle of the samurai. Algren and Katsumoto devise a way to draw the Imperial forces closer so they can fight bayonet against sword. Did I mention Katsumoto is said to not dishonor himself any longer by using firearms at the beginning of the film? A film that's supposed to take place in 1876 to 1877, where no one would choose to not fight with firearms. This is ridiculous. Anyways, just before the major charge into battle, Katsumoto asks Algren what happened to the Spartans at Thermopylae, to which Algren replies that they died to the last man. With a grin, Katsumoto and Algren charge into the Imperial forces, cutting them down in an amazing show of samurai clashing with Imperial bayonets. The samurai make quick work of the Imperials in close quarter combat, but an entire regiment and the artillery is left. One of the most incredible cinematic moments in history occurs during the ending where Katsumoto, Algren, and the remaining samurai make a last charge towards the Imperial artillery. They are all gunned down by Gatling guns in an absolute blaze of glory. Mass-produced Western Gatling guns destroy hundreds of years of traditional samurai warriors. Katsumoto asks Algren to help him commit seppuku while he lays dying on the battlefield. The Imperial army, seeing the samurai dead, and dying on the battlefield, cry and bow to them, understanding now what Japan has lost. Honestly, this is one of the most perfect cinematic moments that touch you at the core. When you know the significance of the historic event they were trying to capture, you can forgive them for the alterations to the real history. It's an excellent scene. Emperor Meiji is given the sword of Katsumoto by Algren and finally comes to understand that he has been manipulated by Omura at the cost of the Japanese people and their ancient culture. Meiji asks how Katsumoto died, and Algren states that he will instead tell him how he lived. Part 2 So, The Last Samurai is basically two events merged together. The Boshin War of 1868-1869, and the Satsuma Rebellion of 1877. Jules Brunet, aka Captain Algren, was a French military advisor who was employed by the Tokugawa Shogunate to modernize its army in 1876. America was involved in dealing arms during this time, 
But Japan sought military advisors and arms primarily from France and later on from Prussia. Sorry, America. There was a growing civil war between pro and anti shogunate forces. The anti shogunates sought Sono Joy to revere the emperor and expel the Western barbarians, and the pro shogunate forces saw the signing of treaties and working with Westerners as essential for the survival of Japan, lest they be caught in war and colonization. The Satchu Alliance of Satsuma and Choshu Domain were the main anti shogunates who won the series of battles against the shogunate forces. Eventually, Emperor Meiji took the throne and he backed the anti shogunates, leading the remaining domains loyal to the shogun to be labeled as rebels. Jules Burnett surprisingly went against France's orders to leave Japan and instead stuck with the rebels to help fight this new imperial army. As you can imagine, Algren is loosely based on this character, and since this movie was made in Hollywood, they changed him to be American because, well, everyone hates the French. Pardon? Vous êtes Francais? You. That was for the waiter. The Satchua Alliance was widely successful during the Boshin War because it traded with Western nations like Britain for artillery, specifically for Armstrong field guns. Domains on both sides of the Civil War traded with Western nations for an assortment of different guns. While the Shogono forces had the most guns, they did not have much modern artillery early on, which led to a series of losses. Saigo Takamori of Satsuma led major battles during the Boshin War, such as the famous Battle of Toba Fushimi, and Katsumoto is based largely on Saigo Takamori. Saigo Takamori took a major role in the new Meiji government after the Mojin War was concluded, becoming one of the three Ishin no Senketsu, three great nobles of the Restoration. Saigo understood the need of modernization, especially for the military, and was a supporter of most of it. However, as more reforms came to be, Saigo gradually took issues with the societal effects brought on by such rapid change. The samurai class was dissolved as everyone in Japan became equal, and with it the samurai lost their special class privileges. These privileges were to carry a sword, wear top knots, being allowed to kill commoners who show them disrespect, and certain exemptions from taxation. Umura Mosujiro, the former daimyo of Choshu and rival to Saigo of Satsuma, became Huibui Dainyu, vice minister of war. He modernized the imperial military and this required conscription and the training of commoners. This made the hereditary feudal samurai that had served Japan for centuries basically obsolete. Amura in the film is most likely a portrayal of certain industrialists during the Meiji Restoration, but I have to believe he was based largely on Amura Musujiro, who was reviled by the samurai so much that he was eventually assassinated by ex-samurai, not to mention Saigo had problems with him. Saigo Takamori famously was against the construction of railroad networks, insisting that the money should be spent first on the military, and Amura's character in the film owns railroad networks, so there you go, I guess. The samurai represented about 5% of the population of Japan, and most found employment in the new Meiji era in uh, the military or in business. But many could not find a place in this new world and fell into unemployment, poverty, and a lack of purpose. Saigo Takamori saw the disaffected samurai and believed the Meiji government was leaving them behind in a pursuit for modernization. In 1869, a Japanese envoy was sent to Korea to establish diplomatic relations and to acknowledge the new Emperor Meiji. The Koreans declined to recognize the Emperor. It's a complicated story I can't get into, but regardless, this was an insult to Japan. In 1873, there was a legendary debate called the Sikanron debate over what to do about Korea. Saigo Takamori and his supporters insisted that Japan confront Korea with a military expedition. Saigo volunteered himself to go to Korea as a special envoy where he would act like a asshole to piss off the Koreans so much they would try to assassinate him, thus giving Japan a legitimate reason to attack. He was a literal badass. Saigo was so determined to have the expedition because he saw it as a way to provide income and purpose to disaffected samurai. Perhaps they could even occupy Korea, much like the daimyo occupied the former Han system. The other Meiji leaders rejected Saigo's idea, and this was the last straw for Saigo, who resigned from his government position and retired back home in Satsuma. Saigo then opened up military academies called Shigaku to train disaffected ex-samurai. The Shigaku taught weapons training, military tactics, artillery, and the Chinese classics. Whether intentional or accidental, 
These academies expanded enormously, and Saigo inadvertently created a parallel military in Satsuma. By 1876, Satsuma Prefecture seceded from the central government. The very worried Meiji government tried to stop the situation via force, but the students retaliated by raiding the military arsenals in Satsuma and armed themselves. The students eventually persuaded a very reluctant Saigo Takamori to lead a rebellion against the Meiji state in what was famously called the Satsuma Rebellion of 1877. Saigo's rebellion was to stop what he saw as political corruption in the Meiji government. He fought the government not to stop modernization per se, but to stop the direction it was going in. Saigo saw the abandonment of the samurai class and the rejection of the expedition on Korea as intolerable. In essence, his rebellion was to make grievances known to the Meiji state and to show them the misdirection of their reforms. Saigo's forces were defeated at multiple battles and were forced to go on the run. Then, when all options failed, they made a last stand at the legendary battle of Shiroyama. They died to the last man in a blaze of glory, having to resort to using swords as they ran out of most of their munition at this point. Saigo himself famously committed seppuku, having received a mortal gunshot wound. The rebellion ended the samurai class, but was unable to overcome the paragon of traditional samurai virtues felt by most Japanese. Saigo and his men's last stand was revered by the Japanese people, and even until the 1890s, some thought he was still alive, hiding out, and waiting just to come out of his retirement. The Meiji government pardoned Saigo Takamori on February the 22nd, 1889, dubbing him the true last samurai. The Meiji thinkers eventually realized that they must go about modernizing using two methods. One was to adopt new Western ideas, but another was fuko, to restore antiquity. The idea was that while they were adopting new Western ideas, they were also looking back at their ancestral past to create a fusion of the two. Bushido elements would eventually be incorporated into a new nationalist movement being adopted by all citizens of Japan. Part 3 Of course, firearms during this film remain a large problem. Uh, Saigo Takamori used firearms, as everyone in Japan did, going back to the 16th century. It was extremely proficient. I mean, come on, they were even using artillery. One of the key features of his academies was artillery, using a variety of Western arms purchased, like the Armstrong Field Gun. The idea that Katsumoto does not dishonor himself any longer by using firearms is ludicrous. I mean, how in the hell would he have fought the Boshin War in 1869 using firearms and then suddenly after 10 years has changed his mind? This is so stupid. Anyways, again, a few YouTubers said that the Springfield model 1861 and the Einfield pattern 1853s in the film were outdated by 1877. And this is, of course, it is true. But they were historically used alongside primary weapons such as the more modern Schneider Einfield rifle. To be honest, all the domains in Japan had a mishmash of different firearms, many of which were outdated, but you know, they used what they had on hand. During the Setsuma Rebellion, Saigo's forces famously used swords, but not because of any notion of traditionalism. They simply lost most of their guns and artillery after so many battles with the Imperial Army, and you know, they were on the run. Even during their last stand at Shiroyama, Saigo's forces were using firearms, with the little munition they had left. I think the main issue with the film, you know, they could have kept the Bushido and the traditional Edo nature presented while having Saigo's forces still using firearms. The fusing of the Boshin War and the Satsuma Rebellion is understandable, just like in other films such as uh, Alexander, which merged the Battle of Granicus, Battle of Isis, and the Battle of Guacamole all into one. Sometimes you cannot fit everything you want into one movie. I believe it was actually quite clever to incorporate Algren, aka Jules Burnett, to be the outsider viewpoint into this world. It was also genius to have Algren's past fighting Native American tribes contrasted with the Satsuma Rebellion. It made for a very interesting comparison. Both Native Americans and the samurai who rebelled against the Meiji state were distinct people being torn away from their way of life in a violent and brutal manner. They both faced a modernizing force which did not seek to make compromises with their distinct culture and traditions. On that note, you can't watch this film without acknowledging other films that influenced it, specifically Shogun, Kagoshima, The Karate Kid, and of course, Dances with Wolves. The Last Samurai and Dances with Wolves is practically the same story. A military man, torn by the horrors of war, is leading a life of self-destruction. He is from a technologically advanced society seeking to modernize and link up a nation when he comes into contact with a less technologically advanced society. This society of an ancient people with a rich culture spanning centuries. 
The man mingles with this society, learning their language and way of life, and through his contact he finds redemption in his own, no longer wanting to die. He joins this society and eventually he fights for them and their way of life, despite the fact that they are on a futile path to destruction and he knows it. A lot of people, and rightfully so, bring up the issue of the white savior complex when it comes to films like Dances with Wolves or The Last Samurai. Of course, there are tropes in both these films, which can't be ignored, but I would stress that both films tried to not be complete tropes. The white savior trope, for those not familiar with it, is when a white protagonist joins a group of non-whites who are experiencing a conflict, and the white savior usually aids these people by teaching them or fighting for them, ultimately saving them by basically using his amazing power of being white. Yet, Captain Algren in The Last Samurai and Lieutenant Dunbar in Dances with Wolves are merely our eyes when looking at the Suya and the Samurai. Did they save these people? No, they didn't. Algren and Dunbar are simply witnesses to historical events and the lives of these people. Both characters are unable to change the fates of these people. Both characters see the futility they face and do nothing to stop their demise. For lack of better words, Algren and Dunbar are just on a ride while the Suya and the Samurai are driving. Another thing I believe people attribute to this film is in the title, The Last Samurai, seeing Tom Cruise on the box. I do believe this was a failure, you know, on the result of marketing. Obviously, Katsumoto is the last samurai, as he is based on the real last samurai, Saigo Takamori. And, you know, you watch this film, and it's blatantly obvious the last samurai is indeed Katsumoto and not Algren. Yet, I've seen a lot of articles addressing this, so it seems like a lot of people assume Algren was taking this spotlight somehow. I really don't feel that's the case at all. After all, Algren chooses not to die in the battlefield, and that certainly is not very Bushido-like of him. Uh, can a historical movie be good but not very accurate? Of course. The medium of film is not simply to tell it how it was. It's a form of art, after all. The filmmakers obviously put a lot of love into trying to depict a rather complex and very romanticized period of history. And if you really want an accurate portrayal of the events in this film, why not click on my end cards? <laughs> Thank you very much for watching, and please smack that like and subscribe button so I can feed my parrot for a few more months. She needs her peanut fix. This has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.